Hey everyone, this is Tommy from the Ravens Creek Study, and we are looking still at theological matters. Uh, this is Systematic Theology 1. Uh, we're still looking at sources for theology. I put out the first video of this section last time, and I uh, want to discuss the Wesleyan Quadrilateral. Now remember, when we're talking about theology, we're talking about uh, a study of God and His relationships with pretty much everything. So when we're speaking of sources, or we're speaking of any of the means that, that God can use to teach us or to give us understanding or to show himself to us, you know, anything. Now, there's this term within, uh, within theology, uh, the Wesleyan quadrilateral. You're not going to hear everybody use this term. This is specific to John Wesley. So you're going to hear like the Wesleyans, the Nazarenes, uh, maybe the Pentecostals and Charismatics. Uh, really, the Charismatic movement, beyond Pentecostalism, the, the Charismatic movement, you're not going to find a whole lot of uh, deep theological source, just to be entirely honest, but um, essentially the Wesleyan quadrilateral, we're going to get in, into it in the next slide, uh, he, he came up with four main sources, therefore quadrilateral, um, but the source that we're, when, when we say that it's a source for theology, it's a source that God can use to teach us, it does not have to be authoritative. What I mean by that, <clears throat> uh, we, we, we talk about the Bible having authority. The Bible, we take as we, we, we take it as, as God's word. Like this is specifically without fault, if you, if you will. Um, there are things in there that are difficult to piece together to understand exactly as to what it is that it's trying to convey. But we take the Bible as being an authority, being the, the one thing that we can go to and trust that this is teaching us about God as he is. It's not telling us something where we have to go through and interpret it and try to kind of chew the meat and spit out the bones as the, as the phrase goes. Um, but not all of the sources have to have that kind of authority. You know, we all have hobbies and interests that influence the way that we read the Bible and understand the scripture. And even those hobbies and interests can be sources for theology. So when we get into the Wesleyan quadrilateral, John Wesley, John Wesley had put forth four uh, main sources, if you will. Uh, there are four different main sources. Tradition, experience, reason, and scripture. Now, these things, we can, we can define them loosely. And I know that as soon as I say tradition, there's often everybody kind of gets in their mind, oh no, that's not good because, you know, Jesus was scolded for breaking from the traditions of the fathers and, you know, we shouldn't have that kind of tradition. But that's not what I'm talking about. Uh, and I'm not talking about traditional versus contemporary uh, church stuff either. You know, it's not a matter of being in robes and going back to the Catholic heritage. Uh, tradition is just essentially, we, we all grew up in a certain denomination or if we were, or if we were not in a certain denomination when we grew up, uh, when you came to Christ, when when you found Jesus, there was a certain uh, denomination or a certain background that most likely influenced you the most. Uh, there's, we, we all have um, our favorite speakers, our our favorite authors. This would be tradition. It's those people who are influencing us. It's that it's that theological background, if you will. That's our tradition. Now, whether that tradition is actually pointing us to Jesus or pointing us away from Jesus, well, that, that's something that we need to consider, and that's something that we need to have humility about and, and be open to the possibility of. But ultimately, what I'm, what I'm trying to put forth here is we all have some sort of tradition. We all have an experience. You know, The way that you yourself relate to God, that's, that's your experience with God. Uh, and even, even our hobbies, you know, I, mentioning it in the last slide, our hobbies and our interests, I would say that that even falls underneath experience. If you enjoy science, and and science causes you to understand the Bible in this way because, you know, whatever, that that's part of your experience. If you enjoy gardening or if you enjoy raising livestock, you know, and and that's going to teach you these things about sheep or these things about um, the way that that God is the good shepherd. I mean, again, that's part of experience, but it's showing you so much about who God is. Same thing with reason. It doesn't have to be philosophy. You don't have to be a philosophy major to have reason. It's just deduction. It's a matter of putting pieces together. It's a matter of coming to conclusions. It's, about, it's a matter of not just reading something and forgetting about it, but dwelling upon it and allowing it to really saturate and, and, and really sink in. You know, there, there needs to be a balance 
of all of these four things with Scripture at the forefront because it is the authoritative one. It is the one that we can go to and we can just trust it. Uh, but, but there needs to be a balance, a healthy balance of all of these. Everything that, that could be listed outside of these four sources, in my mind, seem like they would be categorized within one of these four. And I gave a few examples of that. You know, um, tradition By tradition, what is meant is our influences that we read and listen to. Uh, it is not tradition versus con contemporary, nor is it why do you break from the tradition of our fathers. You know, I guess I'm repeating myself here. Um, experience is twofold. It's our interests and hobbies, and it's also the things that you've experienced. So when, when, you, when you came to Christ, when God found you, when, when you were saved, whatever theological term most jives with your theology here, ultimately when you were saved, there was a certain experience that you had, you know, that you went from not saved to saved. You went from not knowing God to knowing God. Something happened. That experience is going to tell you about your theological, under, it's going to influence your theological understanding. If I start telling you that when, when you say this prayer, if nothing happens, you're saved, and you say, well, now hold on a second, I prayed this prayer and I... I did experience something. There were several things that happened. If suddenly you're going to be looking at what I'm saying and, and you're going to start asking the question, well, if he's right, then my experience is wrong. And oftentimes, it's not bad to, to question the experience, but oftentimes the experience is the truth. Uh, and again, it's not bad to question your experience. Um, I can think of several examples where, where the experience was indeed the wrong experience to have. But my point is, with something like that, the, it is oftentimes with a relationship with God that you actually do have an interaction there. And when God is giving you some sort of an experience, some sort of an interaction, you can trust that. Again, it's not bad to have reserve in some way, but... Because, I mean, I'm sure you can think of, of times when uh, if you push too far into the experience realm uh, and, and feelings specifically, but if you, if you push too far into the experience realm, you're going to then neglect uh, the, the other parts of, of this quadrilateral that are going to keep you balanced. Um, reason, again, I think I've said this already. Reason does not have to be specifically philosophical, but it does have to be deductive. Uh, what I mean by that, <clears throat> the... Before the Greeks had invented the, um, the, the methods of philosophy, before the Greeks had come up with all of that, there were other cultures in the world who were practicing deduction and reason. So it doesn't have to specifically be the Greek way of philosophy. It just has to be that you're putting two, two and two together to make four. It just has to be that deductive power, you know? Um, so, last slide for this little video here. Putting too much emphasis upon any one of these four will create error and potentially heresy. Again, we can think of several things. I can think of the charismatic movement that emphasizes a lot on experience and feeling, and very little scripture is discussed almost always when we're talking about the big names within the charismatic movement. Um, this would be the, the Patricia Kings, the, the Benny Hens, and the Todd, uh, the Todd Whites, and look, it's not that they don't mention the scripture, they do, but it's just such a quick, the Bible says, and then moving on to the good stuff, that you wonder whether they actually want to talk about the Bible. And same thing with, um, same thing with, with the opposite, we can, we can put so much emphasis on philosophy, I think of like, um, well, I shouldn't mention names here. Uh, philosophy, we can put enough emphasis on philosophy that instead of consulting the scripture and trying to piece together what the scripture actually says, we are now consulting our own deductive powers, you know, our own reasoning abilities, and coming to conclusions that might even be contrary to scripture. Um, another one would be tradition. We can go so far into church history that we can say, you know, so-and-so came up with this idea of how it works, and I really like that idea. I think that's probably what it really is. But then we don't consult the scripture and ask the scripture, well, is this what lines up? It's a matter of, well, I saw a theological issue where there seems to be 
a red flag here or a yellow flag here and, and I'm using caution and I read what people said and this one guy said something brilliant, I'm going to go with that. You see what I'm saying? Like there, there, are, there are dangers within emphasizing any of these. Uh, more than being incorrect about our doctrine, which is important, but what's more important is that our, in emphasizing one area too much, it can and probably will cause for abuse, for haughtiness, for arrogance, for manipulation, for a lack of discernment, and all sorts of ungodly ways of treating people. So think of it this way. If, if you have reasoned through to conclusions about what the scripture is teaching, and you've spent a lot of time developing your understanding, if somebody comes and questions that, what's the first reaction? The first reaction is to prove that they're wrong and or to prove that you're right. Like That's the first reaction. It's to prove that they're wrong and or that you're right. And in, in trying to prove that, you are potentially going to become haughty, arrogant, prideful. Uh, that, that, that's a kind of knowledge that puffs up, right? Potentially, you're going to manipulate, not just uh, in, in your argumentation, but also trying to manipulate them and belittling them. And, and that will then also come into abuse. If you, um, if you are the one who says, well, I've come to these conclusions, I'm the spiritual one, I'm up at the front, I'm the, I'm the one behind the pulpit, you can, you can run into the error or the danger of abusing people. And you don't even have to be behind the pulpit to do this. You can just come to the place where, um, because you have come to such and such conclusions, wherever your emphasis might be that in how you got to that conclusion, it really doesn't matter. The point is, when you've come to a certain place, it's possible to have that danger of abuse. That because you have the right standing with all of the fathers throughout the faith, you know, from 200 onward, I don't know, <laughs> trying to make something up here, but... Uh, because you have this, all of this theological backing, you know, that, that throughout all of the centuries, we have always believed such and such, you're now able to stand up in a way that is abusive towards others who have a differing opinion. One of those differing opinions that I think is quite critical is that God has not yet cast away the Jew, that God still cares for Israel. There are a lot of evangelicals who believe that. There are a lot of people who are not evangelicals who believe that. It's a, it's a modern belief, and yet, traditionally, when you go to the church fathers, they did not believe that. That's a somewhat new, I mean, it, we can find people all the way back who did believe in it, but, but the overwhelming um, force, of the, the overwhelming voice of the church fathers is that we have replaced the Jew. We are the new Israel as the church. I think it's a completely erroneous statement, but that is the view. And think of it this way. That kind of view gave precedence for things like the Crusades or for the, um, the slogan, kill a Jew, save your soul. It's not that, it's not that an error or emphasizing in one area more than the other is going to lead you to heresy. It's not that it's going to lead you to abuse, to arrogance, to manipulation, to a lack of discernment because you're based upon experience and not upon reason nor scripture. Um, it's, not that, it's not that it's going to lead you to that and that it will happen, but there's a very, there's a very real danger here. It can happen, and we need to have those guards up to make sure that if we're going to step into this direction, if we're going to continue forward, we need to have enough humility to realize, I am a frail man. I have the potential of stepping into this ungodly way of looking at people and treating people. And in fact, my history, I'm talking to you as, as Tommy here, my history shows that's something that I step into quite easily. And God has been dealing with me, and I'm not and I'm not even just saying theologically. I'm saying even before I was a Christian, when I was 16 years old, when I was 15 years old, when I was 12, when I was 5. 
you know, th my history shows I am one who does not treat people very well. And because of that, I know that I need to have enough, uh, enough safeguard uh, to, to know when I'm stepping over my bounds. And I think that's a, a good practice for all of us to have. Um, but this is, this is where theology really, it's where the rubber meets the road. It really, it's where it really hits home. It's that we can look at uh, even the way in which we study theology. We're not even getting into theology. Like, this is pre-theology. Hence, prolegomena. But this is like pre-theology. We're, dis we're discussing how to study theology, and already we're coming into, th and we're coming into things that, that get very real very quickly. The way that you study theology is going to influence the way that you treat other people who study it differently or treat other people who have come to different conclusions or treat people who have not yet come to conclusions. You see what I'm saying? Like, just even the way we study matters because if we study it in a, in a biased way, we're going to cause for division. We're going to cause for haughtiness. We're going to cause for arrogance. We're going to cause for... Uh, an elitism. We're going to cause for um, breaking away from this or that, or or from throwing people under the bus. Or we're going to cause for you know all sorts of all sorts of things. And our compassion, our our hearts here, it should be upon the Lord cares for His sheep, and He wants to see His people to be united. I mean that that's what the prayer was in John 17, that they may be one as we are one. And, and isn't that what Jesus also said, is that the, world may, that the world may know that you sent me. I mean, this is, this is like, <laughs> this is Jesus 101. And if we're going to study in a way and not keep up safeguards for ourselves that, that could potentially cause for us to not be one, to not love our brother, to to do quite the opposite. Well, now we're suddenly getting into a, a very, um, I don't want to say difficult, but it, it's a very its a very bad place to be. So, uh, I'm going to start breaking these down a bit more. Um, the tradition, uh, experience, reason, and scripture. I'm also going to add another, another one to that. Um, so, surprise when that comes up. But, I'm going to start breaking these down a bit more and asking the question of, what exactly about uh, tradition can help us to know God better? You know, what what's the exact, what am I getting at here exactly? So, uh, thanks for listening to this one, and until next time, grace and peace to you in Christ.